Thank you, everyone, for joining us at the Project Censored radio show. We're very glad right now to be joined by Adam Broomberg, who's an art artist, activist, and educator based in Berlin. He's on the faculty of the MA Photography and Society program at the Royal Academy of Art, The Hague, which he co-designed. He was one half of the celebrated duo Broomberg and Chanarin until 2019, and his most recent work, Glitter in My Wounds, was published by Mac Books and recently exhibited at Signs and Symbols, New York City, the Dusseldorf Photography Triennial, and at Magazine 3 in Stockholm. He spends his time between Berlin and Palestine, where he runs an NGO, Artists and Allies, Hebron, alongside the celebrated Palestinian activist Issa Amro. Adam, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. So uh, when I stumbled upon your work, my initial reaction was, bleep yes uh, a fellow jew being very outspoken and creatively so uh, about israeli apartheid now alternative media not least of all uh, us here at project censored have covered the issue of apartheid israel and the necessary struggle for palestinian rights but i think something that doesn't get a lot of coverage is the important distinction between zionism the colonialist project that is israel and judaism um, so could you start us off by sharing your thoughts on that distinction and why it's so important for Jews in particular to make that distinction clear? Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe uh, a good start would to be explain to explain the kind of ingredients that make up my particular minestrone, which is quite um, unique. I am so I'm the third generation of a Holocaust surviving family who escaped Lithuania, mostly Poland, Russia, that was the area in the early 30s. So my grandparents, um, uh, all four of whom lost, you know, the, the majority of their family in the Holocaust. Uh, we're, so I was born in South Africa. I was born into an apartheid South Africa um, as a Jew. Uh, there were about 250,000 Jews who escaped Eastern Europe and arrived in South Africa. And um, we'll get onto that later, but one of the things that uh, really struck me when I kind of, when a penny did drop, was how quickly my family included uh, really relished and enjoyed within minutes the kind of change from being the bottom feeder as the Jew to the uber privilege of the white person in an apartheid society, right? So, but what I'm trying to say is when it comes to apartheid, I have a unique um, understanding of it, having firsthand experience. I became an activist at the age of 15, 16, which was 1985, 86, the height of the struggle against apartheid. Um, and so I really do have an understanding of its logistics, of its emotional impact, and also what it took to fight it. Um, I also went to a Jewish Zionist day school from the age of, you know, for all 12 years of my education. Um, so I have also a profound understanding of, I guess, both what I consider the real ethics of Judaism, which I hold dear to this day, um, because I consider myself very Jewish. And, um, and I hold those that moral compass that came with that, with being Jewish or what I was taught, I hold dear to me. But at the same time, I was fed um, a lot of lines and a lot of propaganda during that education that, um, you know, from the age of six onwards, um, that almost at the same time as when I was 16, when I suddenly understood that being, you know, because we were so segregated in South Africa that it was quite easy to be an ostrich with your head in the sand. Um, but suddenly when the penny dropped, not only did it drop for me being a white male person in an apartheid country, but also some of the the kind of 
the narrative that I was being told every day about uh, my so-called homeland, the nation state of Israel, also started to kind of uh, collapse around me. Um, so I guess what I need to say just from a very personal perspective is that I am very Jewish, I feel very Jewish, and I also feel very entitled to criticize a country that is acting in my name because it is a Jewish state. Um, and I, I feel capable of, of, of or, or I feel entitled to criticize it without being called uh, an anti-Semite or a self-loathing Jew or you know anything like that. Uh, can I just get a glass of water? Sorry. Well, I've, I've got a good example to give um, when you're ready. Yeah. Um, I, I wore the shirt for you specially today, which is um, if you if you looking at this thing, it's uh, it says Hebrew Orphan Asylum on the front of the church. Uh oh. Anyway, <laughs> fucking hell, what did that? <laughs> Woo! My analyst would have a field day. Um, okay, I'll start that again. Um, I wore the shirt especially for you today. If you're watching on video, you'll see it said it says Hebrew Orphan Asylum. If you're listening to it, it's kind of um, beautifully embroidered blue and white shirt. It actually is a um, a remake of, of a shirt that was produced in 19, 1860 in New York because uh, they they there what there was the first orphanage for Israel uh, for for um, Jewish kids built in the Lower East Side, and it was placed right next door, uh, what was called the Colored Orphan Asylum for for children of color. In 1863, I just looked this up because it almost sounds like a haiku, you know, Hebrew Orphan Asylum. It's like the oddest thing. And uh, the last time I went. Um, uh, to Palestine, you know, landing in, in, in Ben Gurion in Tel Aviv, I was wearing a shirt and black people were just so puzzled by it. <laughs> um, but anyway, on a more serious note, in 1863, there was a draft called for uh, white men to join the military because the, the civil war was going on. And um, there was, and still today, to to, to, to this day, it, it, it became the biggest race, could we call it a riot? Um, but it was initially a lot of Irish men joined by a lot, but it was all white men marching through New York, um, protesting the, 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 the draft, the call up, right, to serve in the army. And it became progressively more and more violent and progressively more and more race orientated. So, for example, when they went down the, the street where this Hebrew orphan asylum was located, they passed it by, but they did enter the next um, orphanage, which was the so called colored orphan asylum. And they destroyed the infrastructure and apparently wounded a lot of uh, the people inside it and what really struck me about that story is that we're talking about 1863 and already our privilege as white people being jewish was evident and i think that's something to really um take into account and to really think about you know and I know a kind of instant rebuttal to that would be, you know, my brother-in-law is, is a Sephardic Jew who comes from Morocco, who has a lot darker skin and would say to me, you know, don't call me a white man, you know, but I think um, for whatever it means to anyone listening, I think uh, that's what I took on board suddenly, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And I think unlike being a black person in the US or really anywhere, but since I'm I've, I'm from the US, 
you don't notice someone walk I mean unless they're like a Hasidic Jew or something you don't notice that they're Jewish walking down the street but you can't not notice that someone's black or has darker skin um so there isn't this recognition immediately that someone is Jewish and so the comparison to that uh, that some Jews make to that of being a black person or uh or uh, or darker is 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 is, is absurd um and I'd, I'd like to because since you have that specific, unique experience of growing up in an apartheid state and then now fighting an apartheid state, Zionism is something that a lot of Jewish families struggle with in terms of like, you know, if you asked certain members of my family if they were against the South African apartheid, they'd be like, of course, that was awful. And then you're like, but are you anti-Israel? And they're like, no, of course not. <laughs> so like, how do you... I'm curious how you how you look at these uh, those two comparisons having been in the thick of both of them. Okay, um, so there's a few parts to the story because it, uh, to slightly kind of complicate my personal story is to tell you that I have a sister um, who's lived in Israel in Zichron Yaakov, which is north of Tel Aviv, um, for close to 40 years now, um, with her husband, three children, and gorgeous kind of um, grandson now, um, all of whom I love to bits. Um, her husband fought in the uh, Israeli army during the, the massacres in Shatila in, in, in Lebanon. Um, my nephew fought last May in uh, Gaza. So you can imagine how complex this is, right? Um, to kind of navigate and to discuss between us because we do love each other. Um, and yet we have, you know, um, I think, and a testimony to that love is the nature of the discussions, which is my family there don't think that my solidarity work with the with Palestinians um, is intent or is intended to bring on the destruct their destruction, their, their annihilation. Okay, and. I think that's really important to mention. I think, um, ironically, out of anyone in my family, because I've got four siblings, um, and in a very large extended family, my sister and her husband who live in Israel are the two who most recognize the importance of my work, although I don't, I, I cannot underestimate like and or un underplay how difficult it is for them because i think them being close to the situation um they have an inkling of what's going on um across that you know um 12 meter high concrete barrier wall the truth is though and they know this is that i have spent more time in palestine than their entire family put together and the time they've spent in Palestine is in military uniform. And so that's a very different way of being in a place, um, right? Um, so you mentioned the NGO that I've set up with Isa Amro, and it's in Hebron. And um, the reason we chose Hebron is, is uh, so Hebron is, is the second biggest city in the West Bank. It's home to kind of 250, 60,000 Palestinians. Um, in 1994, I believe it was, um, a religious fanatic Jew called uh, Baruch Goldstein, who's a follower of Kahani, who's, who's uh, whose followers are now in the Knesset, in the government. And Kahani was pronounced an, a, a terrorist at the time, and his Kach movement, a terrorist organization. Um, uh, what, what's happened is that uh, a lot of the followers of Kahani and the Kach movement uh, are, 
the illegal Jewish settlers who are there are followers of that movement, right? And in 94, Baruch Goldstein walked into what's called the Cave of the Patriarchs, which is probably the most holy site for all three religions, which is in Hebron. And he killed 29 Palestinians and injured 150. Um, he's a mass murderer. He's a terrorist. But as you enter Hebron now, when you enter um, into the Jewish settlement, there is a tomb that's devoted to Baruch Goldstein. And on that tomb is written in Hebrew something like, and I might be misquoting it slightly, he gave his life to the Bible and the teachings and the wisdom of Judaism. Um, I, I can't describe the shock I felt when I saw that too. Um, and the, the fact that a mass murderer was being memorialized and celebrated. Um, I cannot imagine what that feels like to the local Palestinian population. Um, it's the equivalent of taking, uh, well, I, I, I don't need to even give a, a comparison to an American audience, you know, take, take any uh, uh, kind of school massacre and, 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 and erect a tomb to this person and celebrate their existence. Um, but what's more to the point is that Hebron has been now, so the day after that, uh, Israel declared a state of emergency. And what they did is they made every Palestinian in this cordoned off section, which is called H2, so it's a significant part of the whole of Hebron, they um, they called a lockdown, which we've all experienced over the last few years. But this went, uh, the, you know, for the last two years. This went on for a few years. They sealed all the front doors of the Palestinian homes. They closed the market, which was the most thriving market in the West Bank. Um, and what they did is they um, defined it as a military zone, which distinguished the way that Palestinians were treated under the law because Palestinians are subject to military law in, in Hebron H2, while Jews or the illegal settlers are subject to normal Israeli civilian law. Um, the Jewish settlers are, are able to use the main roads towards their settlements. Palestinians are not. They have to walk through the cemetery in order to get to their houses. Um, H2 is a kind of little microcosm, it's a, it's a Petri dish that if you just dip, dip your head into it and you don't need a microscope for 15 minutes, you have a perfect understanding of, um, of apartheid, you have a perfect understanding of how the occupation works because the settlers dressed in their yarmulkes and their tzitzit, walk hand in hand with the Israeli soldiers. Um, um, and people are subject to different kinds of laws, right? And so it's everything I experienced for my 20 years under apartheid. Um, but I've got to say something, it's much worse. It's... Um, and this is my, my greatest fear is I don't feel a need to justify calling Israel an apartheid state. I think it's something worse. And that's what terrifies me is that even during apartheid, um, we were mixed together. People in the big cities were, you know, people would move together and touch one another. And there was a kind of there was a kind of sensuality and attractiveness for the, for me in that, uh, you know, obviously maybe for an older uh, person or, or, or a more racist person, there was something vile about that. But the point is we were interacting on a daily basis. And my nephew, the one I spoke about who served in the military last May, has never met a Palestinian. And so when people are othered, when they become the other, 
and you have no interaction with the other, they are depicted simply as the toxic enemy who wants you annihilated. And you've had you've had no interaction, not, not not physical, verbal, sensual, whatever, then it's a much more toxic situation. And I think um, you know, the writer Foucault, the theorist Foucault spoke about, um, he spoke about leprosy and he spoke about the structures that were built around leprosy or the leper colonies to prevent leprosy getting out. And he said, when they finally got rid of leprosy, the infrastructure was still left behind. And I think, I think the so-called security wall, which let's, let's, be honest, is a tsunami of concrete higher than you could possibly look up and goes eight meters below the ground. I think that infrastructure does the opposite of what Foucault is talking. I, I think that that infrastructure creates the leper. So the, the very calculated um, division between the Palestinian and the Jewish population has created such um, separation that not even in one's like most benevolent imagination can you picture somebody who would warmly embrace you. And for my nephew, when you say the word, because he's unable to even say the word Palestinian, but Arab, he imagined he conjures up somebody who is who wants him dead and um and so i think it's worse than apartheid actually yeah and i can't help but wonder if if it hadn't been that way when you were growing up in south africa would you have become politically active at 15 or 16 like would you have cared because then it wouldn't have been your friends or people you'd met that you were fighting for their rights, it would have been the other. And so why fight for the rights of, of somebody who's demonized and that you've never even met? Well, this brings me on to another interesting story is that I was in Rwanda um, right after the genocide. So we're talking 95. And I met the most remarkable woman there who I haven't been in touch with since I'll never forget her. Her name was Riva Adler. She was a Canadian Jewish academic. And Riva kind of um, specialized in genocide. She was spending months in the jails, interviewing the Hutu perpetrators of the genocide. Um, Riva said two things to me that I will never forget. Um, she's the, 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 the first thing she said is, um, there's almost a kind of mathematical formula for a genocide. And if you look at the constellation of genocides over history, including um, the Jewish one, so let's for a moment not call it the Holocaust, which gives it a special identity, but a genocide. Um, the socioeconomic conditions, the, the modes of communication, everything was perfectly set for that to that little stick of dynamite to be detonated as it was in Rwanda, right? In, in a very different way. Um, the other thing she said to me, which really struck me because it got, it, it really made me understand my family is that, like I said, you know, my grandparents arrived at the bottom tip of Africa speaking Yiddish and suddenly without expecting it, were treated with the respect that white people and the privileged white people were given, as opposed to being, um, you know, uh, subject to pogrom after pogrom and, uh, you know, eventual almost annihilation as Jews. Um, but what Riva said to me is that survivors of genocide, survivors of a trauma of that scale, have one of two reactions or responses when they encounter injustice. By far the majority of the survivors when they encounter injustice will hide under the table because the trauma is so 
profound that they're so scared of power that no matter them understanding the uh, how toxic what they're witnessing is, they're too afraid to stand up and, and, and be vocal about it. But there's a very small majority of survivors of something like a genocide who when they encounter injustice will not only stand up on the table, will put another table on that table and will shout as loud as they possibly can. And there's a handful, not a handful, yeah, a, a few handfuls of Jewish South Africans who, um, without whom, and they written into the history of the struggle against apartheid, all of Mandela's lawyers in the Ravonia trial Joe Slovo, the head of the Communist Party, his um, his beloved wife, Ruth First, who was blown up in a letter bomb that was sent by the South African government in Mozambique. L.B. Sachs, who lost his arm and other things in an attempted assassination of him. Um, and these are just a few of the Jewish um, activists that had a huge profound um effect and and uh, on the uh, the bringing on the end the demise of apartheid and so um and i think it's the same with our generation i honestly do i think first of all i'm not sure of your background but i think we've all inherited a degree of trauma i think I was fed on a daily basis the idea that Israel was the last possible haven, the bunker, when when it happens again. You know, that's what if you know my mother would say often. Um, my grandmother certainly, who was you know much older, but my mother really felt deep down in her soul, and. So I think that we all have that, and we have the trauma of facing this this kind of notion of power, but not realizing that, and Primo Levi warned of this, he warned of it. Primo Levi warned, there's a beautiful quote, and I, I, I won't try and re remember it, but where he talks about the Holocaust as a, as a kind of the plague being over, but it's still in the air. And he was talking to, to his fellow Jews when he said that intolerance, a lack of empathy, a lack of solidarity to humanity could lead to something as terrible. And I think, I think that now what we've got to realize is that the nation state of Israel and the way it's behaving is not okay it's not okay in my name as a holocaust surviving jew it's not okay for them to use the holocaust as a justification for their existence or for their despicable uh punishment of of a, a, an entire people and um and it calls into question something that um, I'm not sure if you know Fred Moten, who's like one of my heroes. He's a, a theorist and a poet. And he said something that I will never forget. He said, because people often ask the question, does Israel have a right to exist? And what Fred Moten said is nation states don't have rights. Nation states are meant to ensure the rights of the people that live within them, but not at the expense of people who don't live within them. And if you really want to know my opinion, and I think, I think Fred Moten shares it, is that Potentially, the nation state of Israel is the biggest threat to worldwide jury that we face in the next half a century, if not less. 
And I really mean that. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. And as somebody who's been to several uh, gatherings of neo-Nazis and fascists in the United States, I can tell you that a lot of the things that I overhear are the conflation of Israel with Judaism. And so the existence and the continued terrorism of Israel drives anti-Semitism around the world. And I think that is absolutely dangerous uh and, and and so the the uh the safety very ironically of course the safety of jewish people all over the world uh cannot uh cannot exist with the continuation of uh, israeli apartheid but and, uh, no, yeah sorry to interrupt no go ahead no not only that i think that something something worse is happening which i've experienced viscerally like uh physically in the last 10 days. So 10 days ago, I was in Hebron and I was, um, I was attacked by a pack of maybe 20 um, Jewish settler kids in Hebron. These kids aged from the range of seven to 17. And um, luckily I'd been kind of debriefed by Isa, who runs this um, center in the middle of Hebron devoted to um, kind of peaceful uh, activism, so nonviolent uh, activism. And he said, look, this happens almost weekly. Um, uh, and the reason they send the kids is that by law, you, you just cannot touch a kid. You can't defend yourself, right? So I was walking back to the center and I was literally attacked somebody, you know, with like punches, sticks, uh, kicks and other things. And luckily I just kind of kept my, my arms to my side um, and just like kind of took the punches um, and until I was kind of safely through this weird like Lord of the Flies type horror. It, it was a bit like, you know, those nightmares you have when you're being attacked and you, you, you're you paralyzed, you can't run or you, or you can't defend yourself. It was a bit like that because some of these kids were big, you know. Um, and then the second story is on the night of my return was the uh, memorial of Kristallnacht in Berlin which marks essentially the beginning of what we would call the Holocaust. And, and the celebration every year, celebration, the memorial, excuse me, happens on the site of one of the two biggest synagogues that were destroyed in Berlin. And I'd never been to, to this memorial. And I went there and I was, you know, I received an invite in an email and the invite was headed Jews against fascism everywhere, right? And I, I came up and there were people singing Yiddish songs and and a Holocaust survivor was giving a testimony. And I saw a big banner that was on which was written Jews against fascism everywhere, because essentially this memorial is against worldwide fascism, right? And at one point, something odd really happened is another group with um, holding a bigger banner. And in the center of the banner was a Magen David, was a Star of David in blue. And it said, defend Jewish lives. And they kind of moved ever so slowly, but consistently in front of the, the banner that said, Jews against fascism everywhere. And I had produced these kind of small posters that were on sticks and, you know, so I was handing them out. And I went up to one of the people and I said, hey, like, this is a huge space. Why don't you just shuffle over and there's enough space for both banners to be visible. And he kind of grabbed the, the post I was holding in my hand, which said the same thing, Jews against fascism everywhere. And he said, uh, first in, in German, which I didn't, so I didn't understand, but then he said, like, take this bloody thing away. And I said, what, what is it that's written here that offends you? Is it, are you anti-Semitic? 
And he said, no. I said, are you a fascist? He said, no. I said, so it's the word everywhere? And we looked at each other and I said, when you read everywhere, do you replace it with the word Israel in your head? At which point he kind of got really quite physically um, violent again. So this was like three days later, I'm now in Berlin experiencing this. And luckily the, the German police were really close by. So I went to stand near them and my kids were home alone. So I called a cab and, and waited close by the police, but I got home and I was like, I was shaking and I lay in bed and I thought, my God, I have spent in the last five days. And as a documentary photographer, I've been to really dangerous places. I mean, I grew up in Johannesburg, South Africa. I spent time in like maximum security prisons in criminal psychiatric hospitals in, you know, but these two events were by far the two that I felt most threatened physically and existentially. And in both cases, there were the, the people threatening me were Jews. And so when you say this is potentially a real threat to us Jews because it's, it's increasing worldwide anti-Semitism, what it's also doing is dividing us to the point where I think that it wouldn't be beyond the imagination that both of those people, the 17 year old settler kid and this 40 year old um, German Jewish man would have wanted me dead, right? And that's the point we've got to where it's not even about, we're not talking about Kenya West, we're not talking about the uh, Pat Robertson or, or the obvious anti-Semites like Donald Trump. We're talking about uh, potential like uh, hate amongst what is meant to be a kind of community that shares values, right? Well, it's it's clear, just like that tomb that you mentioned, that the values are um, certainly not shared, and uh, they apparently the teachings that they got growing up are vehemently different than the ones that I got <laughs> or that I understood as Jewish teachings. Um, but uh, I mean, we could this this conversation could easily continue for for days, and I think that uh, these conversations need to happen, particularly in Jewish communities, because as you said, there is this. Uh, I mean, civil war, I've always hated that term because what's so, what's civil about it, but um, this internal war uh, in Jewish communities, but I, since we need to wrap up, I do want to ask, is are there any like, are there any points that you would like to highlight in terms of uh, Jews who might be listening to this episode and who have struggled to bring this up in their families? Mm -hmm. uh, how would you suggest broaching this subject and are there any points that you'd you'd highlight for for folks to to consider i think there's two things to one is a slightly more um and it sounds counterintuitive but i think the words apartheid i think the words occupation which are both actually legal terms um and terms like BDS, which I think BDS has now calcified into most of the young generation don't even understand what BDS stands for. It's just what they understand is it stands for anti-Semitism. And I, th I think to, I think we should think about what terms we use. And a term I've been more and more referring to is the idea of Jewish supremacy. And I think as harsh as that may sound, I think it's a term that's relatable for any American. The idea of the supremacy of one race over another is absolutely visible and evident. Um, and there's no question that, you know, the 2018 law of the Jewish nation states that came in in Israel 
stated very clearly that Jews and Jews alone have the right to declare their, their right to exist in the Jewish state. So, and, and um, Arabic was demoted to a second rate language. And so even in, examining the law without any emotions, we understand that the Jewish state, Israel is, has, is, is, is in a state of Jewish supremacy. And the other thing I would say is that the only way my sister and I are surviving um, to maintain our relationship is um, to simultaneously be able to feel the love that you do for family, but also to be really and separated from my activism or her, her, her commitment to, to the country, but to be consistently honest as well. And I think that I asked her a very difficult question at the end of a very, very difficult conversation while I was in Hebron. And I said, I said to her, I said, Mandy, if it came between choosing between a country and your brother, what would you choose? And I'm not going to tell you her answer, that's between us, but I think that given our history as Jews and how countries have perpetually uh, pushed us out, you know, I, I, I think nation states are not the answer. And I think that countries are not the answer. And I think that honestly, like love and solidarity that's first found in feminist terms in the family, the people closest to you, and then spreads outwards from there to cousins, community, and then to other, other people of different race and ethnicity and beliefs. And I think, you know, if we could, if we could follow bell hooks a little more, maybe um, there's an answer there. So that's it. Bell hooks does have a lot of good, <laughs> good answers to difficult questions. Um, well, Adam, thank you so much for taking the time. I appreciate it. Is there a place where folks can go to see more of your work? Um, uh, yeah. Uh I mean, my Instagram is basically um, I uh, I use it as a place to to publish most of our projects. And when you say my work, I work with kind of quite a big team of people from around the world that are um, all extremely amazing and talented people. Um, and we have a website called Arsis Allies Hebron. But um, but for now, I think my Instagram is is where uh, most of it is put, and I've just actually published a huge um, resource on readings on Palestine that's um, in the bio of that. And I think if anybody says this is complicated or it's difficult, I think there's enough reading in there for somebody who's really wants to or is concerned. Um, um, so I would. I would suggest to head over there. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.